um, in a lot of ways, the book is also for both Rebecca and Jasmine. It's about how are women seen and is the way in which we are seen the way we want to be seen? Is it the way we see ourselves? Welcome to our latest episode of Book Reporter Talks To, where our guest today is Jean Kwok, and we are going to be talking about her latest novel, The Leftover Woman. We're doing this interview a few weeks before publication and before our review runs, so I will share what Bookless had to say about this in a starred review. Kwok brings her signature lyrical prose to the novel, while suspense simmers in the background. Highly recommended. It's a library read selection, can be a book reporter bet song selection among many, many of the accolades that this has received. It's on so many full must read uh, lists. Jean was one of our first book reporter talks to interviews. And I think this is the third time she joined us. It was one way, way, way back at the beginning in the office. So with that intro, welcome Jean. It's so good to see you again. Carol, thank you so much for having me. I mean, you know, I love Book Reporter and you um, especially, and actually you're too modest to mention, you are even in the acknowledgements of The Leftover Woman because we were just chatting before the interview began and you were just talking about what you are doing to give attention to a particular author who you felt her book had not gotten the attention it deserved. And that is the reason that you are such an amazing force for literature and for authors today. Oh, you're so kind. I tell you, I just feel like you're writing. I got to make sure it gets its best shot. That's where I come from. That's where I come from. So I was lucky enough to hear you talk about this book in a pre-pub lunch, a really lovely lunch that your agent threw. And you called it your most personal book, which you also detail in your author's note up front. Can you share for your readers the background on why this book is so personal? Well, you know, so just to give a quick intro on what The Leftover Woman is about, right? And then I'll tell you what mm -hmm. my um, personal connection is. You know, the, for those who have not read the book, The Leftover Woman is about a young woman, Jasmine Yang, who gives birth to a baby in China uh, during the one child policy. And she's told soon after birth that the baby has died, but she finds out a few years later that her baby had not died, but had been given away by her own husband to a wealthy American couple for adoption. And um, when the book opens, Jasmine has followed her daughter to New York City to do whatever it is that she must do. The book is told from two points of view, from Jasmine's point of view, the biological mother, and from Rebecca Whitney's point of view, the wealthy, successful, um, adoptive mother who also makes mistakes as Jasmine does, but loves her adopted Chinese daughter with all her heart. And indeed, I said to Carol that this is my most personal uh, book ever because it touches on topics I haven't really talked about uh, in public before, which is that I am the youngest of seven children. Um, I am female. And, you know, therefore, by age and gender was at the bottom of my Chinese family hierarchy. So I very much identify with Jasmine's um, oppression through most of the novel of the feeling she had that she was not able to speak. She was not expected to speak. Uh, she didn't have the right to speak. Um, in a lot of ways, the book is also for both Rebecca and Jasmine. It's about how are women seen and is the way in which we are seen the way we want to be seen? Is it the way we see ourselves? You know, whether you are beautiful or not, if whether you are successful or not, there's such a discrepancy between how we see ourselves, how we want to be seen and how um, the outside world sees us. And that was something that I very much struggled with as a poor working class Chinese girl growing up in a very traditional family. Mm, definitely. And you definitely feel that coming through on the pages. You know, I have to confess that I did not know that the one child policy was around for 35 years. And some readers might not even take note of how long it's been. 
being introduced in 1979 and implemented in 1981. And I didn't realize at first that it was that long ago. And I know it was rescinded in 2016, wasn't sure when, and then two children were allowed. And by 2021, three were allowed. What, what would happen that all of a sudden they realized this one child was not working out? Was it the fact that um, there was a lot of uh, infant side going on in the, in the country or there aren't not enough workers support the older population? To be honest, I really think that it was probably the latter. I mean, I think that there were many years when, um, you know, people realized the birth rate became extremely skewed because it is in, in traditional Chinese culture, a son is what you need, right? You need a son in order to um, take care of you in your old age, in order to bow to you in front of the gods, in order to preserve the family name and the ancestral name. When people were allowed to have as many children as they wanted to, it wasn't a problem because you could have girls and boys. But when people felt forced to choose because the penalties were so punitive, you know, sometimes people could be forcibly sterilized. I mean, the fines were like a year of a person's salary. I mean, it was just, you could be fired. There were just, it, they were really, really so extreme that people felt they had no choice. And then given, you know, their upbringing and what they felt they needed, they felt they needed a boy. So it was clear that those girls were going somewhere, like something's happening, right? It's like the birth ratio became so skewed. I think that at the present time, there are 32 million more men than women in China, 32 million, wow. you know, so, uh, and, you know, it should, of course, be around, right around 50-50. So I think that it um, it was evident from the beginning that either through abortion or through adoption or through abandonment or, you know, infanticide that people were doing things to skew the ratio. But what happened is that that one child policy has backfired in a way so that um People are now like the younger generations, like, oh, fine. We don't need to have kids at all. <laughs> or having one is enough. I, I was an only child. Everyone I know is an only child. Why have two? Let's have one. Um, and so, you know, that actually brings us to the title of the book, The Leftover Women, which is the leftover women is a term that China is now using in its propaganda uh, against young women who have not married and have not produced children because, you know, it's like we're getting, you know, screwed both ways. It's like you were not allowed to have more kids, but now they want to promote marriage and they want to increase the birth rate because it's dropped so drastically. And guess what, guys? Without enough women, birth rate isn't going to be doing very well. Um so, you know, now they are kind of shaming women who are not married by a certain age. And it's very young. It's something like 26 or something. If you're like in your late 20s, then you are considered a leftover, like, uh, you know, like a leftover on a plate, something that gets thrown away. It's wasteful. It's not used. And uh, that is almost like a sin in some ways. Wow. Wow. Now, is what happened to Fiona, because I remember for a long time, there were a number of Chinese girls who were being adopted here in the United States. It was going on for a very long time. And then it's kind of stopped or slowed down. Is what happened with Fiona something that happened with many girls, Fiona being the baby that was brought here? Is that something that we saw happening on an ongoing basis? Well, so obviously, so what happened with Fiona, the child in the book, is that she was taken away without her parents' knowledge um, and well, without her mother's knowledge. I mean, with full awareness on the father's side. It's hard to know how much of that kind of stuff actually happened in real life. I think that, you know, most, especially most agencies did their best to make sure that everything was on the up and up and that, you know, the adoption proceeded um, with full knowledge. And I, I think that there were many girls who were placed for adoption, who did, who, where that happened with the knowledge and consent of, um, 
everyone involved. I am also sure that incidences like Fiona occurred where, um, you know, the girl was placed without consent or knowledge. So I don't, I'm not absolutely not saying that was widespread, but I'm saying that it's not far from reality. And in the writing of this book, I was very careful to interview people from every side of this debate, you know, from, you know, girls who had been abandoned and left to die and then saved by sometimes a distant family member, sometimes by a kindly person, um, from girls who have been placed for adoption, been adopted and had the experience of growing up in the West to interviewing the parents, you know, who either gave up the child or who adopted Mm -hmm. um, somebody from China and who loved their children very much. And it was important for me in this novel to present a balanced view so that it wasn't like, it wasn't, for example, condemning people who Mm -hmm. decided to adopt uh, a Chinese girl because I think that it's it's so complicated. It's just so incredibly complicated. And there is an argument to be made that a lot of those women um, wound up with a better life than they could have had back home. And that is the, in, that's the situation with Fiona, that Jasmine, her biological mother, loves her so very much, but Jasmine has no means. Jasmine is in, you know, she's in New York illegally having paid snakeheads to Chinese mafia to get her there. So she doesn't really have the means to take care of her daughter while Rebecca really does. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And Rebecca is such a great character because she works at a publishing house. So we're going to get a little bit of inside baseball here with publishing. So let's talk about first her relationship, Rebecca's relationship with her father. She's got one that's more fraught with her mother, but she's got a great one with her father because this clearly has impacted a lot of what she feels and what she says. So let's talk about that first. Well, I I love it that you're bringing that up um, because that's just such an insightful detail. So Rebecca Whitney, right? Who's Rebecca Whitney, the adoptive mother? She is successful. She's high powered. She's smart. She's caring. And she's doing the dance that so many of us do, which is that she's a woman with a career and with ambitions, but she's also a mom. And she loves, you know, she loves her child. She loves her husband. She's trying to keep all those balls in the air at the same time. And she's being judged so much more harshly than a man would be in her position. She's being given less support than, you know, she would have if she were, let's say she were a man and she had married someone who was willing to, let's say, be the supportive wife and take a second step to her career and who cooked and cleaned for her. I mean, she doesn't have any of any of that. She's a woman. She is, however, very wealthy. So she's fortunate and privileged in that way, a fact that she's very well aware of. And she was taught by her father that... Um, it's not enough to be born with these privileges. You need to earn them. You know what? And so much of Rebecca's life is about trying to earn her place, trying to earn the privilege that she was born to. Um, but in some ways, she's also blind to her privilege. And that's kind of what the book plays with. And so indeed, it's like she loves her father very much, but her father in a lot of ways, wanted her to be a boy too, right? It Mm -hmm. echoes Jasmine's story, you know, that her father, you know, has her and loves her as she is, but kind of raised her the way he would have raised a boy and in some ways might have preferred having a son instead. Yeah, that's exactly. You know, you talk about the children of privilege. It often ends badly with children of very successful people. At Harvard, she saw her wealthy classmates twisted by the uh, pressures of their legacies. And her father said, being born with beauty or talent or wealth, that's just dumb luck. What you do with it, that's what distinguishes a great man. Of course, we would add or woman in here. So that's what he's saying. And he's really setting her up for, you've got it all. Now, what are you going to do with what you've been given? And too many people just rest on their laurels of what they've been given. And she is determined to make him proud, even though he's now passed away, to make the, his, the, his legacy proud. Have I nailed that one? Absolutely. Absolutely. 
you know? So, so publishing is also this build business of relationships, the agent author, the editor author, the way they all work together. And you share how those relationships can help secure a deal or have one lost. And you do a great job of giving background on the book publishing world, which I think that a lot of readers are going to completely enjoy because you're going to get immersed in this world and learn a lot about it. And including what happens in an auction, how much fun was it to write those scenes where you're writing about something you really know a little bit or a lot about? <laughs> it was so much fun, Carol. I That's why, of course, I made Rebecca an editor, um, an editorial director, because, you know, that's a world I know very well, as do you. Uh, it's kind of insider baseball, indeed, where, you know, it's just like, it's the kind of stuff that when you are not in the publishing world, you wonder, how does an auction really work? What's really going on? What are the politics? Do people sleep with each other at the Frankfurt Book Fair? You know, <laughs> that kind of thing. And it was just so much fun um, to be able to use that knowledge in a character. And I also thought, of course, it fit because, the you know, publishing was one of those industries where it was acceptable for a wealthy, high class uh, person to be involved with, you know, it was trade, but it was still letters, it's art, it's literature. Uh, and there's a real history of that, but mostly with men. So to have a female character try to assume that mantle was really, really just so much fun. Yeah, I could tell. And you know, what? it was also, um, you talk about the anti-powerful well, woman bias in publishing, where books written by men are statistically more likely to be reviewed, well-reviewed, or receive major prizes, and to become best bestsellers. And I feel like a lot of that has changed over the last couple of years, because we're talking about, all of a sudden, we're trying to enlighten the world that it's bigger than this. In fact, we were joking to be, be a white male in the business the last couple of years has been tough. Like to get on a panel, to win a prize, you're definitely putting a letter on your back of like, did your book really, really hold up? Am I on the right track on that too, about how things have started to change? Well, I don't know, Carol. I mean, I think that it's true that things have started to change. But, you know, if you look at the numbers, you, they're still not great. And there is... Um, you know, I would say it's true. I think the pendulum is starting to swing the other way, which is really not the case from even like when I published my debut novel, Girl in Translation. Mm -hmm. When I published Girl in Translation, when I was, you know, first putting that on the market and that that appeared in 2010. So probably about 2008 was two years earlier was when I was showing the manuscript around, trying to get an agent, you know, all of that kind of stuff. You know, there were people who said, there's no market for this book. Nobody is interested in a book about a girl of color, an immigrant girl of color and her working class life. And that has definitely changed. There's a much bigger market now. At that time, you know, it was only like Amy Tan, Lisa C. Those were the only people we could point to, to say, well, look, you know, there's a thirst for this kind of book. You're not going to lose money. You know, people are actually going to read it. People, And of course, Go On Translation became an international bestseller and is taught in schools around the world. But <clears throat> that was not a given when it was going into the publishing world. And I think things have changed greatly. But, you know, there is there is always a bias. And I, I don't think we can rest on our laurels yet. That's what I would say. Okay. And I definitely see there's more work to be done. More work to be done, but we've moved, try to move the needle. You also talk here about children of privilege. And it often ends badly with children of very successful people. At Harvard, she saw her wealthy classmates twisted by the pressures of their legacies. Her dad said being born with luck or talent, beauty or talent or wealth, that's just dumb luck. And I think that we're really, really true about like listening to this as an idea of what's going on right now, because you have to be better. You have to be better than what happened before. You have to be better than what was going on. And you also mentioned the private school pressures that go beyond school and the extracurriculars. Dance is just one way it starts as a very young age. And I think you hit on it so well in this story where Rebecca wants her daughter to be at the elite dance school and in the higher class and all these kinds of things. Let's talk about that kind of an impact because it's not just in school, it's elsewhere as well. 
Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think that those are the kind of intangibles that make it hard for working class immigrants, for example, to compete, right? That we don't, you know, I was not put in extracurricular activities from a young age. There was no money, there was no time, and there was nothing like that. Um, and yet somehow you're supposed to be on an even playing field with children of privilege. But on the other hand, those kids who do get sent to all of those lessons are under so much pressure. And I feel like there are different types of pressure. You know, one is to, you know, you've got to do, you've got to play the piano for seven years so that, you know, you can show your college application um, that, you know, you've done this extracurricular and you're well-rounded. And then sometimes I feel like there's so much, um, so many frustrated dreams of the parents, you know, and that the parent is looking back at their own life and say, well, I would have really liked to have done that. And I should have done that. And I wish I was a competitive professional skier. And then the kid gets sent to skiing lessons for the rest of its life. Um, and I think it's hard to parse that out. You know, it's one of those things that's challenging about being a parent. You know, when are you doing it for your child and their future? When are you doing it for the, yourself? And how important is it, right? You know, can you allow your kid to actually choose what they like to do and <laughs> enjoy yeah. and have talent in? Yeah. You want them to try things, but like, let's get real on what we're trying here. Let's get you. Are we trying, or are we going to become the athlete? We're going to become the, the um, Olympic athlete, or we're just going to have tried doing it. It's a big, big exactly. gap in between. There's a big, big gap. You know, on the other side of things, we've got this moment in the grocery store, which is very early in the book, where Rebecca leaves Fiona with her nanny, and she goes someplace else in the store, and she comes back, and the shop the shopkeeper uh, is accusing the nanny of stealing and accusing this. And the little girl is going, no, I wanted the potato chips. It was open. I just started eating them. And immediately you see prejudice because immediately they're going after the nanny, not thinking that the child could have done anything in that situation. The equal is completely on a different plane. It's not the child. Am I there? Well, well, I mean, you know, they actually, he, does think that the child um, may have touched the potato chips as well. But it, what he does do, and you're exactly right about this, Carol, is that he assumes that the Chinese child and the Chinese nanny are together, right? He assumes they're a family and he, you know, is um, prejudiced against them for that reason. And when Rebecca shows up, he's like, whoa, wait, you can't be the mom. You can't be the mom. That was based on something that happened to me. So um, this is actually the first time I'm talking about it in an interview that, you know, I was in a grocery store as a child with my, um, with my mother and we were accused of stealing uh, because I just had, I had some bag of potato chips in my hands and this, guy leapt out of the shelves and was like, ah, you know, you guys, you people have been stealing stuff and you're this. And luckily that bag had not been opened. So he had nothing. He thought I had opened it, but he had, you know, nothing he could actually use against us. But I remember feeling so helpless and so judged just because I was with my mom and we were both Asians in a supermarket in America. And in this scene, I was quite careful because I really didn't want Rebecca to be the white savior coming in. So Rebecca comes in and she said, that's my daughter. And of course, he's totally horrified and shocked, but he tries to fight back. And then it's actually the Chinese nanny, Lucy, who speaks up and says, hey, you know, stop this. You are being racist. You've got to back off. Um, and kind of with their combined forces, you know, they fend him off. And so, you know, that's just uh, that was just something that was what I was thinking about. But yes, that was absolutely based on things that have happened to me. The, all these things that were terrible at the time are now fodder for novels. You just write down terrible incident, bring back, <laughs> you really, you know, by doing it though, you write, this is a personal book because you are bringing up exactly the way people would be seen or felt about or whatever. And 
it is true that that ends, ends up happening. You know, Jasmine, in another place in the book, um, on the other side of things, realizes that back in China, her village, her family name, and where she went to school mattered. And there was a reference point for them. And I hadn't thought about that, like where she came from, her family, everyone knew everybody, they knew their names, but she had some status in that community. Her family had some, and I hadn't thought of that. And then when she's with Anthony, a young guy that was from her village, she feels that she he sees the real her because she doesn't have to explain herself. She doesn't have to conform to something. He knows where she is. I think he as a, um, a, a character with her just brought so much more to the story of what she was able to express. Was he always part of the story? Yes. I mean, I, I had Anthony from very, very early on. And I mean, I love him as a character. I love the relationship because, you know, Anthony and Jasmine were best friends when they were little. They were never romantically involved. And then she basically got sold off, you know, because they're not enough girls. She's like, she was, you know, she was herself born during the one child policy. But by the time she's a little bit older, the one child policy has like, you know, wreaked its toll. And she, um, she's one of a very few girls in the village. And so she gets married off and kind of taken away from him and their friendship. And he's bitterly resentful. And uh, Anthony is bitterly upset and resentful um, of that. So when they meet again in New York, you know, the sparks fly. Um, and um, so, yeah, I always, I love him as a character. And indeed, I mean, what you just brought up, Carol, is such an insightful point because it's how I always think about immigrants and that I realized as an immigrant myself that when you're in your own country, you know, you can say to somebody something like, oh, you know, I went to Brown or I um, grew up in Hoboken. And people know more or less what that means. You know, they're like, oh, yeah, I knew somebody else from Hoboken or I went to that school or my, my brother-in-law did or something. You have a frame of reference. But when you change countries and you've started somewhere totally different nobody knows what those places are you know I mean maybe a school like Brown maybe a really prestigious university but also not I mean think about how many schools do we know from Paris you know or from Amsterdam like and those are European countries you know how many great um, institutions neighborhoods do we know for like in Finland I you know we don't really so it, that reference is all lost and so it's like our identity, I always feel like it's, you know, everybody's reflecting our identity back to us. Like, you know, we're, we're surrounded by mirrors. And then when you move and change countries and cultures, all of the reflections are gone. It's mm -hmm. only you, you know, you're just beaming out there by yourself, but there's no one to reflect that back to you. And so for Jasmine, who's young and powerless um, in the U.S., when she sees Anthony again, although even though they have a pretty irascible, irritable time together when they first meet, it, she feels that recognition and it means a great deal to her. Yeah. And you reference a red string very early in the book that she gave Anthony with this line, two people connected by a red thread will always be together. The magical cord might stretch or tangle, but it never breaks, no matter how far away they might be from each other. And I feel like when she picks up with him, you're seeing that red thread, that red thread that has gone through their lives. And she's looking at him and saying, wait a second, did you remember as well? You know, Absolutely, absolutely. The red thread is a kind of thread that I, I don't know, in my culture, we've always kind of felt like it almost had magical properties. And especially when it's woven into the form of a bracelet. And that's what Jasmine did for Anthony when he turned 14 and they were together in China as friends only. Um, and she made one and she gave it to him. And indeed, when she they run into each other again in New York, he's so rude to her. She's so mad that she's about to stomp off. But then she catches a glimpse of something red on his wrist. And she thinks, could he still be wearing that bracelet? And that bracelet brings them back together. Yeah. The bracelet is like, wait a second, there's a tie. Oh. Pun intended. And he feels it too. He yeah. feels it too, it, despite everything he might be saying. 
So then we've got Jasmine's character is working as a hostess at Opium, a men's club to make money. She doesn't know how to use makeup. She's clearly not worked on evoking a sec her sexuality that she needs to do in the club. And there's a moment where she cuts her hair and bangs and that changes her whole look. And I love the subtlety of that. Did you write details like that in front? And I was thinking of your bangs. Like, do you cut your own? <laughs> you I actually, I, I do cut my own, but my hairdresser's like, you've got to stop doing that. Like, <laughs> stop, stop, stop. You know, she's like, just come by. She's going to do it for free. Please don't cut them anymore. Uh, and once she was like, I understand you want to cut your bangs, but she's like, please don't do anything that would be impossible for me to fix, you know, because like, I'm like, you know, they're crooked. Sometimes they want, but I can't see my hair grows so fast yeah. that like, I, I just, I can't like, actually I need to cut them now. Like now they're just kind of barely okay, but I, you know, but to cut straight is very difficult. Anyway, um, I do cut my own bangs, even though I shouldn't. And Jasmine does cut them, but I mean, I am not, you know, as stunningly gorgeous as Jasmine is. I think Jasmine is somebody who, is beautiful, but um, has suffered greatly for her beauty. And that is one of the reasons that she was, you know, basically married off at such a young age. I think she's 14 when she's married off in her village in China, um, you know, because that she, you know, she has that quality. And so she has spent her whole life trying to hide how she really looks and trying to you know, fade into the background because beauty without power is a real punishment. You know, mm -hmm. it's really, it's devastating uh, because you just get used instead of being able to use it from with agency. And it's in the course of the book, it's one of the themes of the book that, you know, how do people look at her? How does she look at herself? And at what point does she actually claim agency over her own life, over her looks, over her body to take control and to say, okay, I am going to, you know, be myself and do what I need to do with what I have. Yeah. And she's watching also other women in the club. I'm watching how they're using their sexuality, their beauty, whatever's going on. At one point, she gets to look at herself in the mirror and she doesn't recognize herself. Who she saw was raw, visceral, and determined. She was a weapon and she frightened me. And I thought that was such a great line of the woman as a weapon. And the word weapon is used so well. Weapon will come up later on in the book as well as an actual weapon. It comes up a few times throughout. But let's talk about beauty and looks as a weapon because She's watching the way other women are using their looks as a weapon with the men in the club. No, that's right. And, you know, in strip clubs, I did a lot of research on this as well. And, you know, as you know, maybe from if you've read my second novel, or I know you have, Carol, you've read everything, um, Mambo in Chinatown. I did work as a professional ballroom dancer in between my degrees at Harvard and Columbia. And the dance world is surprisingly close to the strip club world, because where do you think they get all the actresses and dancers from? You know, dancers are poor, they make no money, they have the looks, they have the movement, they have the bodies, and um, it's something I saw a lot of people doing and wind up kind of getting sucked into that world because there's a lot of money in it. And there are also drugs and a lot of other things. And it's, it was something I've also actually wanted to write about for a long time. And what's interesting is that in a club like that, in a men's club, you know, who has the power, right? And it's very complicated because on the one hand, you know, the women um, are being paid, they're being used, they're being fetishized in so many ways, you know, a club, even just the temperature in a club, right? They keep things so cold in those men's clubs because all the men are big and they're wearing suits and they're drinking and the women are in like nothing um and walking around right and so it's like everything is the power is seemingly in the hands of the men but in some ways the women are the objects of desire and the women are the ones who are manipulating them to spend and to place down those credit cards and to drink more and to, you know, have more. But, but it's not a fun experience, a club like that for a woman. Um, 
I think that's absolutely true. But those were some of the things that I wanted to talk about, about, you know, when, what is weaponization and when are you actually using your looks as a weapon? Right, right. And also the club is run by a woman. The club or yeah, on the, on the front side of things is run by a woman. And it's interesting how she dismisses women. you like, go home. If you use too many drugs, out of here. This, that, the other thing. So uh, all along, it's like every night is a job interview. Because at any time you could get thrown out at any time they could say you're over. And I find that really, oh, that's how it really is too. Yeah. That's, that's how it works. You yeah. know, that's, and, but, and that's why it is, it works for someone who's undocumented because they're, they're like, we don't need your paperwork. We'll pay you cash. But if you don't show up one night, don't ever come again. You're done. Right. Because they have a huge pool, right? You're, they're totally disposable. So it's like they may like you a little bit, but if you screw up or you make them unhappy or you don't go into the champagne room with the customer they want you to go in there with, you're just out, done. They don't need you. They've got a million more. And there's another um, reason for the leftover woman because it's the leftover woman at that point as well. It's And on many different levels, the title will re- um, resonate. Um, you... Uh, Rachel's relationship with her husband is one that's close, but it also like a typical marriage with two people working in high powered jobs with a lot of pressure. It also has its strains. And I feel like you outline marriage, even when people love each other, those two love each other. And there's still so much stress to, um, to do this. Did you enjoy writing the two of them and writing about their relationship with each other? Oh, I definitely, definitely did. So, you know, Rebecca and Brandon, you know, I think they're like a, I I love them as a couple uh, because Brandon is, of course, a, he's white, but he is a, you know, Columbia professor of Chinese. And so he's fluent in Chinese. He's a language prodigy. And I interviewed a language prodigy in order to fill out his character. Um, And I think that you know, Rebecca and Brandon indeed truly love each other, but it's very hard to have a relationship that's gone on for many years to keep the passion alive when you're both really busy um, and there are so many other forces calling for your attention and when there's a child or children involved. And that's, you know, one of the things that Rebecca struggles with. Um, not to mention, of course, all of the other, you know, crises that I throw in their path. There's a lot going on in their lives. Um, but I, what I also loved about that relationship is that, you know, I, like Rebecca writes, says early on that their friends call them beauty and the brains. And he's the beauty, you know, she's the brains, uh, because Rebecca is really, really smart. And he's smart, too. Of course, he absolutely is. But, you know, he says himself, I'm just, you know, I'm, I can regurgitate, I have a gift for languages, but he said, you, you are the real thing. And that is how I see the two of them, that Rebecca really is brilliant. And, you know, we love and we respect her for that. Yeah. And she's run into a crisis that she's got to get out of. Um, There's a publishing crisis that is something that was of her own doing in some ways, but how it's been documented can come out. So as a result, the book is also a thriller, a mystery as things go, because there are a couple of mysteries that are woven through here. Did you have that all figured out at the beginning or did some come in as you started writing? I, you know, the thing is, you're right in that. Well, first of all, let me just say, Carol, that you are such an incredibly insightful reader because the things you're pulling out are details about the book that are, um, I think, so thoughtful and important and true to the themes of the book. So, you know, a, The Leftover Woman is actually a very complicated construct. If you look at it as a writer and you were to outline it and to put it together, it has a very complicated inner structure. And I hope that to the reader, it's invisible and that it's just really fun and propulsive and you're kind of going from beginning to end in a really, really fun way of, oh, what's going to happen? Who's going to unravel? Who's sleeping with who? Who's going to die? You know, so I, I hope that that's what the experience is like. But in order for it to work out in real life, you know, so that everything falls into place in a realistic way, um, 
I had to construct it very carefully. And, you know, the, I got a lot of it at the beginning. At, from the very beginning, I had the main big twists and the main kind of thrillery points, but there were many, many changes along the way. I mean, there were many structural and character changes because, you know, you get to a point and you're like, oh, they would totally like go to bed together. And then you're like, no, Oh, she wouldn't do him. Oh God, no. So you, you've got to throw that whole plot line out and you're like, no, 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 that's got to go. Or, you know, things that you think can go one way, don't go at all the way you think they would. So um, it's really a balance to try to keep that structure intact and to have it work out without forcing your characters to do anything they wouldn't want to do. Yeah. Yeah. And, but you set the clues up early enough in advance that certain things happen and you see how it's not a complete leap of faith, how they do that thing. It's not a complete leap of faith of how this goes here. And it's also, it's little details like her being in the club. She has to go, what makeup is she going to use? She has no money to go buy whatever. And then there are other little things along the way where she meets another mother. What's the other mother like? The agent, what's the agent like? Even that moment where she's in at lunch and something happens. And she wonders if that little thing, which is really a little thing, will end up costing her getting that book. And there are all these little moments of tension that I feel like you bring in that just go boom, 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 boom. You're constantly involved in, oh, she's got to win. Oh, that was really rotten of him to do that. Oh, that's not fair. So I think you did a great job of you know pulling it all along. And the conclusion is so satisfying. You pulled all the pieces together and that last chapter, and do not read ahead, anybody. You're not allowed to read ahead. That last chapter, I think, is really lovely. I think it's just a beautiful, beautiful chapter. I'm, I'm so glad to hear you say that, Carol. And, you know, I know that sometimes I, I have heard from parents who have adopted Chinese daughters where they're like, Am I, am I, are you going to break my heart if I read your book? You know, and I'm like, no, no, I'm not going to, because I love Rebecca and Jasmine equally. I love them equally. And it was very, very hard to get to a conclusion. You know, there's one kid. It's an impossible situation, right? I mean, the, the, the log line is two mothers, two worlds, one impossible choice. There is one child. Child has to go with one of the moms. And to make that work out in a way that felt authentic and real and surprising and satisfying was really, really difficult. So I'm so glad to hear that you liked the ending. Yeah. Um, I will say that I think that, you know, the emphasis in the book is about unity, not division. It's about how much these two moms have in common. And that is that they love their daughter beyond anything. Um, and they are willing to sacrifice everything for her. And that that is what the emphasis is on. That's what unifies them instead of all the issues that divide them. Right, right. And it really does come through like that. Did you know the ending before you began? Did you know exactly how you were going to do this or... Oh, come on, Carol, you're kidding. No, Carol. I mean, <laughs> normally I do. I thought I did. I thought I did. And then it was like, oh, no, no, no. I mean, at some point in the writing of this book, every character was like, you know, in jail, in bed with each other or dead. I mean, it was like, oh, I killed him off. Oh, no, that doesn't work. No, I killed him off. No, no, no. That's not what I want to do either. Um, you know, I had one draft where I killed off a couple of people. My editor was like, no. <laughs> yeah you know so um no there was there was really a lot of juggling going on and I knew what I wanted the book to feel like I knew what the main thrust would be I knew what who the characters were but how to make it work in a way that would feel satisfying and right and true to how I feel um, and how I hope the reader feels at the end, that was very, very, like that was really a long search until I found that. Yeah, forget searching for Sylvie Lee. You were searching for how am I gonna end this book? <laughs> how am I gonna end no, this book? No, that's right, that's right, that's right. And you know, sometimes people read it and they're like, oh my gosh, I really thought character X was the villain. And I'm like, well, that's probably because that character was the villain for, <laughs> you know, six drafts ago. Um, so it's yeah. really funny. I, if I'm correct, you and Angie Kim exchange work and critique each other. I was talking to her the other day 
And she was funny. She says, y'all send it to Jean. And Jean goes, the sentence looks the same. And she goes, there's a semicolon. Should there be a comma? <laughs> and we were laughing so hard because she says, sometimes you just need to talk to another author. And I feel like even before you talk to an editor, you want to talk to another author about what's going on. Like, are you seeing it? Are you seeing the same problem? Now, how do you work with her? And are there other, other beta readers at the beginning or along the way that you work with? Well, it was really an unusual situation because Angie, Kim, and I were writing our books at the same time. So in her book, Happiness Falls, has just come out to great acclaim. Um, and my book is coming out, I think, just about a month after hers. And so we were working on it at the same time. And we did. We exchanged a lot of pages and feedback. We're both fast readers. So, you know, we would send it, uh, we would exchange, and then within an hour, we'd be on the phone with each other, uh, talking about our impressions of, you know, the manuscript, just off the top of our heads, nothing very detailed or very structural. Um, but it was it was really wonderful to have another writer to bounce off of like that. We're also in a writing group together um, with Janelle Brown, Danielle Trussoni, um, James Han Matson, and Tim Weed. And that group is also wonderful because um, we, at that group deals, doesn't do chapters because it's too hard when you, there are so many of you, but we will basically finish a draft and then submit it um, to the group. And it's great to be working with such accomplished writers um, at a high level and just to hear, well, to see their work at a very early stage but also to hear how people are thinking about it um, and to hear the things that come up and don't come up. And I know with the leftover women, it was extremely helpful to have their feedback in just in terms of how they felt, what they felt was working, what they felt wasn't working, um, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Yeah. And it's also before it gets to the editor, before it gets to agent or whatever, to have other eyes on it. When I was talking to somebody the other day, I can't recall what there were, I did a number of interviews last week. The editor has, um, I think Sarah Packenden actually, she said she wants her, oh, I her, love her editor to have very few like times to look at this because you want her eye to see the most polished so that then it, they, they should not be at the point when you're still constructing. They should be when you really feel like you've got it and then let them amplify it to a higher level instead of them reading it the seven times. And I said there was one time um, a couple of years ago, I interviewed an author and she goes, we did this book seventh times. And I thought the eighth should have been with somebody else, like somebody else should have read it to make sure it because sometimes it goes like this. It kind of unravels, but it doesn't come back together sometimes pieces and unless you're very astute along the way and an editor can do that later if they're not solving who's dead where you know not <laughs> who, who's got the gun you know so well you know i i think that i agree a hundred percent with that and what i'd add to that is that you can only read a book fresh so many times yeah. and that's why you know i think i'm a good reader but i can't I'm not a great reader for myself because I know everything <laughs> I know everything I know so much more than is in the book I know the reveal I know what I'm setting up I know everything and so I cannot read it fresh I have no idea how it feels to a person who knows nothing to read that book and you know with my agent and my editor I do really try to preserve them as fresh reads for mm -hmm. as long as possible I mean especially with the editor at a certain point you've got to get in there with them in fact my editor Jessica Williams at William Morrow who's a phenomenal editor and a lovely lovely person she was at some point like Jean you've got to give it to me like I need it just give it to me you know because she was right like she needed to get in you know uh, and get her hands dirty but I do try to make it as close to the end product as possible before she sees it so that she can read it fresh and she can say, oh, I saw that twist coming from a mile away or that came out of nowhere, but that was way too ungrounded. Like, I feel like that was unfair, you know? So those kind of things are so important. And for her to feel like, well, you know, I expected that. I didn't expect that. I thought she'd do it. I thought that felt slow. I thought, thought that didn't feel slow. Those types of things you really only get with a fresh read. So I think it is ideal 
to have a writer friend. And sometimes, you know, you might not be ready to be sharing your work, Mm -hmm. but sometimes I also just like um, with Julia Phillips, who wrote Disappearing Earth, we will check in, you know, just be like, well, so how was your day? Yeah, I didn't get it done. Or yeah, I had a great day and I managed to write, you know, a thousand words today. Or whatever, just a little check in of how was your day? How's it going? Do you meet your goals? What's your goal for next week? You know, I'd like to do X and then, oh, did you do X? I did, I didn't. Just to have that kind of support can mean all like a huge difference. It mean, can mean the difference between finishing the book or not. Yeah, yeah. And it's also, if you, some people abandon books at some point and say, you know what? I just can't do this. We've seen everything and I've got to start over and it's got to be a new idea because this is not going to go. It's not going to make it. It's not going to work, you know? So does writing get any easier as the time goes on? This is how many books in? <laughs> Any this, well, this is my fourth book yeah. and, um, you know, yes and no, like I am not going to be one of those people who says no, it stays as hard because I think that's not true. I think writing my debut was really, really, really hard because I had no idea what I was doing and I had to learn so much about structure and pacing and all of those things. You know, I could write a nice sentence. I mean, I think I'm better at writing nice sentences now than I could then. But the the architecture of a book was something I really had to learn how to create. And I think I've gotten better and more complex at creating that as I've gone on. Um, so there are, there's some ways it does get better. But I have to say, you know, when I am writing a book, I am filled with anxiety and fear. And I, you know, I spend a lot of time thinking, I can't do this. I can't do this. This is a huge mess. It's unsolvable. (laughs) This is like such a mess of characters and words and stupid situations and bad writing and cliches and stereotypes. I'm like, this is like, this needs to be burned before anyone could see it. And yeah, that's hard. Like, you know, it's hard that you still think people are like, but you, you did it. Like, you did, you wrote other books. They were fine. You can do this. And I'm like, I feel like, I honestly feel like I can't do it again. And that's when it's great to have friends, um, you know, and just kind of random support of people who say, you can do it. You can do it. Just, you know, don't, don't worry about it. It's always difficult like this. You can do it. Yeah, you can do it. It's a, you did it all of those other times. I love the cover. Exactly. I got a final here. Was the title always "The Leftover Woman"? And do this with yes. The, this with this book, the title was really a gift. I had the title from the very beginning. That's not always true. You know, there are bo- other books where we did not have the title. I had some kind of crazy working title, and then you know the editor is like, "Gene, we're going to launch." you know, we need a title. You can't launch a book without a title. It's like, we need the title. And you're like, ah. um, but no, this book, I had the title from the beginning. Yes. I love the cover. The I cover the designer is brilliant. Brilliant. I really love it because there's so many little details. You see the woman's lips, but you also, you're not sure like who is this woman behind here. I just think it's so, so I, I love the real sheen to the cover too. It definitely has the shine that I haven't seen on a lot of covers these days. That's great. Oh yeah, yeah. They put it on and then there's some kind of, they mattified the top or something. They did some complicated thing. And what I what what's really interesting is that this is an actual photograph. So they did not, you know, it's a real photograph that they found of a woman with the background and everything. The only thing that they did change upon my request was that you see at the top, there are buildings that are reflected. And in the original picture, those were buildings that were kind of more generic. And, um, and I said, because it really is the reflection of a win- of a woman, you know, through the window. And just like in the book, it opens and ends with Jasmine and somebody else gazing through a window pane with ignoring the reflection. And I asked, I said, could we make those windows um, and those buildings in the reflection look more like New York? Mm -hmm. Um, so that we have more of a feeling of East and West that she's looking at the city. And I think they did a wonderful job um, of fixing that. It's really, really terrific. What about the audio? Do you end up doing anything with the audio? Do you pick the, do you select the narrators? 
I did. I did. So they, um, you know, sometimes people are like, oh, how, what about, you know, people are like, oh, yeah, well, I read my audiobook. book. Uh, are you going to read yours? I'm like, nobody asked me. <laughs> nobody <laughs> ever asked me. I think because I sound a little bit like Minnie Mouse. So, uh, but it's a good thing. It's a good thing because I, you know, when I hear professional narrators reading my book, I'm like, oh, I'm so moved. Like, I can't believe they could do that. Um, so, you know, they, it's their talent is their thing. They're great. But what they'll do is they will send me a selection and I listen to everyone. And then, you know, in a book where there are multiple narrators, like in Searching for Sylvie Lee, there are three narrators or The Leftover Woman, there are two. I listen to the two voices very carefully. Um, so both apart and in conjunction with each other so that they need to sound different enough that it's not confusing to the reader, but they also need to sound good together, you know, right. not like they're coming from two different universes. But yeah, I, I think the audiobook is going to be incredible because we got our first choice of talent. So you've got Caroline Hewitt, um, Hewitt and Sarah, Sura Sue. Is that how you say her last name? Sarah Sue? I'm not I'll sure. You. Yeah. I'll say you. Okay. We'll figure that yeah, out. Probably. So yeah, because it's, it's interesting because either, I guess each is going to play a different woman and it really is going to make sense when you start to hear that going on. So there was film news about this that I saw on your website. And I know the film world is in like a lockdown right now, but tell us there was something with this going on also with another book of yours. So what's happening? Well, so what was surprising about um, this was that the moment the manuscript was finished, the film rights were preempted. And so um, that's, you know, usually the, you know, the book has to become a bestseller. Or it's actually on the market before the film people start getting interested. But this time it went so incredibly fast um, and it was great. You know, it's been optioned by Kristen Campbell and she does incredible work with so many shows. Uh, she did The Killing, she did C, she, she's just an inc incredible person to be involved in a project like this, uh, she did the plot. And I think, um, you know, it's, I guess it's a sign of the type of book it is and the type of story it is that they felt it could really translate very well to the screen. Um, in fact, all of my books are at this point, they've all been optioned and are in development. So wow. that's exciting. Very, very exciting. Everything comes back together. We've got lots of treats out there. So at the same time, now, though you've written a fabulous book and we're all excited about people reading it going forward, you're working on anything new? Because you know that's going to be the question. As soon as you sit down with your editor, you come into the States, it's going to be, so what do you want? Well, how's it going? It <laughs> well, they've, they've already had that conversation with me, okay? Because um, I, you know, I did sign a two book deal and this is the first book. So I owe them another book. And I'm at William Morrow, which I have to say is they are the nicest best publisher ever the team is so kind to me they do if the book succeeds is entirely due to my team because they are they're just so passionate about it and so great about getting the word out there um and so uh i need to hand in another book pretty soon and that is a murder set at harvard oh so yes i spent this past summer doing some research, going to Cambridge and Harvard, and I am working on it. I mean, right now I have a big tour coming up, yeah. so I'm going to be on the road for a really long time. Um, but as soon as things calm down, I think in December is actually when I stop traveling, uh, then I'm going to knuckle down and really work hard on the next book, which is exciting. I'm, I'm having a lot of fun with the new book as well. Well, I knew you were in Boston all, all summer, like oh, back and forth. So I was trying to figure out what was she doing up there? So now there's the, my answer. Looking for places to hide a body. That's what I was doing, Carol. <laughs> <laughs> Why is she here? The tourists are just so happy she's here. Why are you here? To figure out how to hide a body. Oh, that, you know? I think you're going to be at the Boston Book Festival. So you'll have more time to like look for the body if you're stuck. You know what I mean? <laughs> it's true. It's true. And you and I are going to be together in Morristown. So Morristown I can't Book wait Festival. for that. Yeah, we're recording this in advance because I know what her travel schedule looks like. And I said, let's do this a couple of weeks before she has to go on the road. So we're actually doing this while she's still abroad. Just so I realize 
the last thing you needed was one more thing on your calendar, you know? So I'm really glad we were able to do this now. Jean is always it's so it's great. terrific. I thoroughly enjoyed the book. I will tell you, I did read it in one standing in the pool. Over the break, I stood at the side of the pool and read books like this. And I was getting sunblock on my back because my back was to the sun. And I was going like this, flipping the page. It was just so well done. And I'm looking forward to readers enjoying it. I'm looking for readers talking about it. And I'm looking for you to be able to have the opportunity to talk to people. Beginning of your tour, no one will have read the book. But along the way, I think it's fun to be on tour when people are actually able to talk to the author about something they've read. And you're going to have that opportunity. So the, the, the good parts about being on the road for two months. I could <laughs> two weeks, let alone two months, you know? <laughs> I kept saying to her, she was asking, like, how do I do this with clothes? I said, ship them to my house. I'll bring them to you. There's no way <laughs> I could do this. Kristen Hannett said the same thing. She was going up to Canada and she's going to be in New York. She said, what should I do? I said, ship the clothes to the hotel. That's it. I can't figure out that war in advance, you know? But you see, that that is what Carol does, right? Carol is not just here. She's not just running a company. She, I mean, talk about successful women. We've got a lot of balls up in the air. She's a mom. She's got, and she's also like, come on over to my house. I'll take care of you. Do you need help? Ship the clothes to me. I'll get them to you. So she's really supporting authors in every way. So well, thank you, Carol, for being the, you. Thank the you. The details, the details you can take, like, take care of and take off the plate. When I travel, it looks like I've moved home for life. I take me like, everything with me. I mean, we, we will show up places and I have this like large suitcase and we're staying the weekend, you know, it's like for a long time, for a long time, if I went to a conference and there was a pool, I'd bring flippers and my like music for swimming. And people were just like, really, this is what you're going to do. And I was like, oh yeah, I've got the flippers. I've got the weights. I've got everything. And it's like, besides the clothes, you have to have everything. What if, you know, that's ridiculous. Well, no, I agree. I agree. I will pack seven pairs of shoes for a weekend, <laughs> you know, because you don't know. It's like, you know, you need the fancy shoes, you need the flat shoes, you yeah. need the shoes like with the pants, you need the shoes with the dresses, you need shoes you can actually walk in. And then you need shoes just in case, like, you oh. know, you go out dancing or whatever. So I, I know. And then I'm also someone who's like, by the end of the tour, I'm like, oh, my suitcase is going to be so much lighter because I've used up my, you know, little tiny bottles of shampoo. But then I'll be walking on the beach. I'll be like, oh, what a nice rock. I'll just put it in my suitcase, you know, and then I've got like five pounds of rocks in my suitcase on the way back. So I, I don't know how I'm going to survive the tour. If you guys come see me somewhere, which I really, really hope you will. My tour schedule is on my website, jeanquat.com. You will probably see me in really funny clothing. <laughs> Really funny. You'll coordinate it. You'll coordinate. Is it pack one no. color? I'm like, oh, okay. That's It'll good. be a disaster. It's going to be a disaster, Carol. I'm going to be like, they'll be well, like, what is she wearing? But I really think what you've got to do is along the way, who's going to cut my bangs? And what I think you need to do is call your publicist today and just say to her, okay, I have one more request on the road. Where am I going to get a hairdresser to cut my bangs? And just throw that out there. I think she'll laugh because I know your publicist. I know. You can see they're like so long. My publicist is Eliza Rosenberry. Can I say she's a goddess? She's goddess. a goddess. She's also good goddess. Goddess. if you say that goddess. to her. If you say that oh, to her, my God. Her research it. It will. She don't, will. Don't cut this part from the interview because the world needs to know Eliza Rosenberry is a goddess. If you ever get her as your publicist, you just need to like, you know, yep. give her your firstborn children. Uh, uh, Absolutely. She's on top of it all. She's on top of it all. <laughs> Gina, I'll see you in a couple of weeks. To our readers, we'll yes, see you Carol. Soon. Love you, love you. Thank love you so much, everyone. Okay, take care. Bye. Enjoy the book, everybody. And readers, we'll see you next time on Book Reporter Talks To. Remember, you can find us on YouTube, on the Book Report Network, and podcast is wherever you listen to podcasts, Book Reporter Talks To. Thanks for joining us. Mm -hmm.